which are poetry. In Japan, they honor accomplished individuals by recognizing them as national treasures. If our country were ever so enlightened, Dr. Boyd would be recognized as one of our esteemed national treasures. Nice. Hester Wheeler is our current Michigan's Assistant Secretary of State. He has held more important jobs in public and nonprofit service than I can list. I first met Mr. Wheeler when he was executive director of the Detroit chapter of the NAACP. Thankfully, Mr. Wheeler and I are often in agreement on issues, but when we are not, he can more effectively and powerfully and politely communicate his disagreement with you than anyone that I know. Dr. Boyd will speak first for 15 to 20, 15 to 20 minutes, followed by Mr. Wheeler. Observers can send their questions and comments into the chat box. Professor Johnson will moderate the Q&A. Dr. Boyd, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Um, and no, no microphone. That we're always um, happy to partner uh, with the Damon J. Keefe Center for Civil Rights uh, because it is an ongoing struggle uh, to achieve um, equity for all people in the United States. Um, I think initially I need to introduce myself um, also as a native Detroit. I'm not hearing. Um, and everyone else, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, as a native Detroiter, um, I was born and raised in Detroit and um, I observed um, and even experienced um, improprieties by the Detroit Police Department um, during my um, youth and in particular during my, my uh my teen years in the 1960s. Um, but to understand the sort of broader historical context, one has to recognize that the policing of black people was something that was instituted uh, during slavery. And it's a very different uh, practice with regards to how you dealt with black people who initially were brought to this country um, um, against their will. And even in those instances where black people acquired their freedom, they were still never treated. And it was a very long time before they were even recognized as citizens of the United States. So the, the legal limitations and structures that were put in place um, have affected the way that institutions uh, relate to and um, think about who black people are and therefore how they should or should not be treated. Um, so I think in terms of our particular situation with George Floyd, um, his death, his horrific, um, the horrific murder of George Floyd um, for too many of us saw it as another instance of a public lynching. And it was very disturbing also to note that not only was it a police officer who um, suffocated him to death, there were also other policemen who were standing um, in numb, basically, or non-responsible um, for dealing with and stopping uh, this, um, this act of murder. So he, his death uh, has motivated uh, many people, and I think primarily because people could actually see it. Uh, I have found over, over the years that whenever something uh, would happen to someone Black with the police, something horrible like this, the first question that especially uh, white members of the society would say, well, what was he doing? Um, so they immediately assume that the person was doing something wrong. But even beyond the fact if he was in fact committing a crime or anyone's committing a crime, the police are not supposed to be judge and jury. Uh, people in this country are supposed to have the due process of law that is uh, sup supposedly guaranteed in the Constitution of the United States and was reaffirmed um, subsequently during the civil rights movement. But the civil rights movement and the various bills that were passed in the, in the 1960s um, apparently fell on too many deaf ears. And the sort of social perception that black people uh, are less than human, black people are trouble, black people 
do not deserve to be treated with the same kind of respect that one would treat uh, a white person in a similar situation. Um, to talk about how policing has affected the struggle of black people, if you even observe the treatment of peaceful protesters during the 1960s, the attack, for example, in Selma was just awful. And I always feel uh, terribly disturbed about that because my father's family is from Selma, even though we were not in Selma when, when that occurred. But it was clearly an example of the kind of police and the way that police uh, think and actually encourage at that time by particular government officials how they would handle that. You look at, again, the response of the president of the United States today and his response to the protesters, it was like deja vu, seeing them tear gas and attack the peaceful protesters and the irony of him standing for in front of a church that he does not attend holding up a Bible which is really essentially, especially for black people, um, a symbol of peace and love. Um, all of these ironies go to, I think, the fundamental contradictions that have persisted. Now in Detroit, which we are trying to focus on at this point, has a horrific um, history of police harassment and brutality of black people in the city. And um, as, as a teenager, I remember seeing this group they used to call the the, the big four, and it would be two uniformed and two um, plainclothes policemen in a car. And they would, you know, just appear sometimes out of nowhere and just grab a, another young black uh, man, a teenager usually, um, and just sort of take them back somewhere, throw them up against a wall, you know, rough them up, and then tell them, don't get in any trouble. And this was, this was consistent. So there was a fear of the big four. I mean, they were like, they were literally the boogeyman who could appear at any point, could do anything to you. And there was nothing you could do about it. There was no one you could report to. If you tried to report it, it would just be, you know, dismissed out of hand. So that was um, what it was like growing up thinking about the police. And then very specifically, um, sort of the first situation that affected me personally was when my um, my stepfather um, was in a car accident and um, a white person rear-ended him where he was stopped at a light. And he flagged down the police to simply come over and write up an accident report. And instead of writing an accident report, he said that the police told um, the other um, um, person, the white person, to go along, we will, we will handle this. Their idea of handling something was to, um, you know, cuff my father and, and hold him while, while the other uh, policeman, you know, just, you know, plummeted him, just beat him, and then took him to a police station on Fort and Waterman. I think the police station may still be there, and took him into a room, he said, in the basement level, and um, shackled him to a chair, and any police who felt like it could come down and use him as a practice punching bag. Um, when he was finally released, um, his face, his body, everything was just, it was horrible. He had to go to the hospital, obviously. Um, if he had not been a healthy, uh, strong uh, man, I mean, that could have been a death sentence. And no one would have known it would just been written up as he resisted arrest and therefore I feared for my life, which is the standard line. I feared for my life. Therefore, we had to do this. Therefore, we had to shoot the person. Um, and so the idea of the police as I was growing up in the city was that one thing you don't want to do, you don't want to encounter them. And if there was ever any problems in the neighborhood, no one would call the police for help. We would just handle the. I noticed the adults would just handle the domestic problem and, you know, talk to to whoever was angry or having a fit or there was a conflict, it would have to be dealt with within the community. Because if the police showed up, it would be, it would be a worse scenario for sure. Um, so in 1967, when the rebellion started in the city of Detroit, it was basically instigated by um, 
a, a frustration with Detroit police. And they came to this particular, what they call it, uh, a blind pig and after our party establishment, if they had been rich and wealthy and white, it would have been a private club. But they were there celebrating return of a Vietnam vet. And the police showed up and uh, you know, basically attacked people. They threw one woman down the steps um, and they just said there were people just got tired of it and they exploded. And subsequently, uh, there were there was a, re, a study of these uprisings, these uh, acts of rebellion throughout the United States. And but the Kerner report, uh, basically, which was ordered by at that time President Lyndon Johnson, which report which re stated that essentially. The major, the major cause of these uh, rebellions had to do with the police brutality that had persisted, you know, for decades in these uh, urban areas, you know, in the north, and um, and there were other issues, but generally they said that these were acts of rebellion, not against white people specifically, but against institutions that represented that authority. Um, but instead of adhering to or acknowledging or even uh, seeking some kind of guidance from these findings in Detroit, it was just the opposite. And they, they established, you know, a very aggressive unit that was even worse than uh, the big four. And it was called stress. And stress would basically go out and entice uh, Black people into really committing crimes against them. And it was generally, I think, legally, uh, and Professor Hammer can talk about this, it was it was called entrapment. And so they were creating crime, they were not stopping crime. And stress was supposed to be stop the robberies, enjoy safe street. It was just the opposite, you know, create robberies, you know, and, you know, kill black people. They should have changed the acronym, but basically that was used. And there was a huge rate of deaths. Right now, uh, when I look at these incidents that occur, and they happen uh, throughout the country. And we don't know how many more are occurring because these are the ones that get reported. These are the ones that are videotaped. These are the ones that we can see. Um, but in 1971, um, the Detroit police had um, deadly consequences with 22 citizens and 21 of those 22 were black. Uh, they said it was more deaths than was in the um, the, um, the Irish Rebellion, you know, that was a, an actual war with, with the British Empire. Um, and so that was the reality. And so, um, and also at the same time, there were questions in the community, not only about these illegal behaviors, but also the fact that the police were known for protecting dope dealers, which is a major problem in, in the cities at that time, the in, influx of heroin into the city of Detroit. And so instead of doing their job and addressing that, they were actually getting payoffs from these dealers to do nothing. And these uh, places were obviously primarily in, in, in black communities where this was taking place. So they were not only committing crimes, they were also aiding and abetting uh, crimes, uh, which led to a confrontation with um, a group of young men who had decided that the police are not going to deal with this dope um, that's ruining our communities, killing people, and 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 um, basically creating folks who are attacking black people, um, robbing and so forth, so that they can sustain this habit. And so they decided uh, that they were going to deal with the dope problem. And um, my brother was one. He he was a student at Wayne State at the time. He was a he had just returned a couple of years before from Vietnam. He, he was um, served in the army, served in airborne actually. And um, my cousin Hayward Brown and and then Mark Bethune. Mark Bethune had been a, an activist in Detroit for years. He was um, a student uh, at Wayne. He was a member of SNCC and the Black Panther Party. And so they were just fed up. They, their friends, they saw their friends uh, dying, overdosing, and they felt like uh, they needed to do something because it wasn't going to end if, if they didn't take uh, some responsibility for that act. So what occurred was basically a confrontation with a stress unit um, 
that was apparently um, guarding this, this dope house because when they realized that the stress car was over there, they decided to, to just leave. And the, the car followed them. And as they got to the intersection of Livernoy and McNichols in the city, uh, as they turned the corner, the police pulled up behind them and, you know, shot at the vehicle. And uh, what the police did not realize, I think, was that they were armed and were going to shoot back. And so that shootout sparked, sparked this huge, uh, sparked this huge um, attack on the black community because now the people had shot back at the police. And so they began to like, you know, basically um, grab, harass, they were breaking into houses anywhere that they thought that they may be and so forth. And uh, I, as a consequence that John was my brother, um, I was at my mother and father's home uh, one evening and the police um, arrived. It was like, a, it had to be at least 20 of them. And they literally, you know, didn't knock on the door. They didn't do anything. They knocked down the door with one of those battering rams or whatever with such force that it did not just knock the door open, it tore the door off of its frame. And they came in, guns pulled and everything. Uh, and I happened to, um, my mother heard them outside and told my, my stepbrother, uh, John Clore, to stand in the hallway and she wanted us to all be in clear view. So when the police came in, they wouldn't like, you know, sort of go around a corner or whatever. So I was standing at the top of the stairs and holding at that time, my, my two-year-old brother. And this cop stood at the bottom of the steps with the rifle drawn saying, freeze, freeze, freeze. And I wasn't moving. So I just sort of tried to calm him by saying, can't you see him holding a baby? Because I didn't want him to think or him to say that because I was holding something, he thought it was a weapon or, you know, or what. And I just kept saying, can't you see I'm holding a baby? So he calmed down and he said, okay, just come downstairs. Um, and they ransacked my parents' house. They had no search warrant. They had no arrest. They had nothing. They had nothing. And then they arrested, um, attempted to arrest me, um, not just me and my uh, stepbrother who were arrested. They tried to arrest my mother, but she said, I'm not going to a police station with my baby. I'm not going anywhere. And so the lieutenant figured she's not going. So um, it was really interesting. So they left her there. And fortunately, my father was not home or my baby sister because I can't even imagine what his response would have been in that situation. Um, and the thing is, is that my father, after that beating, understand that he did he was had a suspended sentence because he was a war hero. He fought in World War II. He had a purple heart. He was decorated, purple heart, bronze star for bravery, all of that. And I think that's the reason that the judge did not sentence him to jail. In addition to the fact he had no criminal record and he was a, you know, a tax paying, you know, law abiding citizen. But at the same time, the police were not in any way reprimanded for what had occurred. So in a fast flashback to the, the, the stress situation, they arrested us, took us downtown. I didn't even, they didn't even tell me what I was arrested for. When I got, when they put me in the car, this one cop said, started writing, reading my rights. And I remember saying, I know what my rights are. The problem is you don't know what my rights are. And so he kind of stopped mid-sentence and turned around, and didn't say anything else. And when we were taken down there, we were just uh, they attempted to intimidate us, to make us feel, you know, full of fear. Um, and I just said, I'm not talking to anybody but a lawyer. And subsequently, we did file a, a lawsuit, and it was a class action lawsuit against the city of Detroit Police Department. And um, and we outlined all, and there were a number of us in this lawsuit, but the, the lawsuit was named uh, for um, my um, family, Clore versus the city of Detroit. And so um, that led basically to really um, the, um, the election of Coleman Young, which he had declared that he was going to fire the police commit, uh, chief who he was actually running against in the election. And um, as one of my poet friends had said, uh, this is not uh, 
you know, who happens to be white. He says, this is not a fight between black and white. This is a, a fight now between life and death. And, and it really was. If we could imagine if um, John Nichols had been elected mayor of the city of Detroit, I mean, I just would have moved to Canada. There just was no way that one could live in the city with a man who had, you know, was, you know, just horrible and really believed that black people had no rights and that his uh, police officers were not held accountable for all of the egregious assaults that they had made on the city. Um, fast forwarding to the, the end of that, um, my brother um, and John, my brother John and Mark Bethune, as well as uh, my older brother, John and Mark had gone to uh, Atlanta. They left Detroit. And, um, and down in Atlanta, they were ultimately killed uh, by police. Um, and actually by uh, a police officer who I will not name because I have no interest in according him any fame. Um, he, he was black and he was also one of these cops who the black community in Atlanta hated. My cousin, one of my cousins saw the shooting and they, this guy wasn't in uniform. He just walked up and, um, and shot my two brothers who were standing there and they were talking to him. And I always felt that you know, they let their defenses down because the cop was black and they, they didn't really know that he was a cop. They thought he was just, you know, another brother. And, um, you know, and then Mark was subsequently killed, uh, I think, on the campus, um, Atlanta University campus. Um, and the police um, arrived and that was just a really horrible scene as well. Hayward was a, acquitted. Hayward Brown went to trial, was acquitted by citizens of the city of Detroit at that time, by of all all three, there were there were one two uh, instances shootouts on December fourth and December twenty uh, seventh. He was acquitted of both charges, and the and the defense was self defense. Um, and Ken Cockrell, the late Ken Cockrell, was his attorney, um, and um, it was just really something to see. I remember George Crockett was the judge in one case, and then Judge Gardner was uh, oversaw uh, the second case. And I actually had to uh, testify in one of the uh, trials to so that the jury could hear what had happened and how they had treated the family as an example of the um, character of you know the Detroit police force. Um, after Coleman Young was elected, though, there were major changes in the police department in the city of Detroit. Um, and as, as he promised, the first thing he did, he fired you know, John Nichols and he just had the stress unit disband. Um, and he, took, he heated the, um, the suit that we had filed. Um, and um, actually um, some of us actually got some money. I went to University of Michigan grad school, get my doctorate <laughs> with my funds. I always called it my deeper, my Detroit police officer's scholarship. Um, and things began to change. He changed the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the race, um, gender, everything changed on the police force. They set up a, an oversight, um, committee to, um, that were represented by, um, uh, people, citizens of the city. Um, um, friend of mine who was an attorney at that time, uh, he was, hired by the police commission to investigate um, any kinds of complaints citizens had against the police. So there was this oversight committee that was put in place. The um, Coleman actually tried to do even more progressive things, which was to require um, police and, and I think firemen as well. He said they should live in the city, should not live in the suburbs because it's like having you know, a, an army that comes in and just basically, you know, polices an, ocu an, 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 an occupation that is unhealthy. They need to know the people who they are supposed to be servicing. He did not win that, um, um, that argument because the Detroit Police Officers Association um, took it to court and it was eventually uh, overturned at the Michigan Supreme Court level, I believe. I think Peter Hammer could give more details on that. And so that was problematic. However, uh, policing uh, in Detroit became so much better. 
and um, so many more people of color were hired. Um, even a good friend of mine um, who was a graduate of Michigan State and also Wayne State Law School, um, she became the first black woman um, precinct commander. Uh, that's how different things change. But even in that case, she used to tell me that, you know, you have to remember that even if the policeman is black, um, they are also blue. And so dealing with the institution uh, required a lot more than just changing the color of faces or, um, or the gender of the officer. Some of them were very much a part of this new and progressive idea of serving the people. Um, and others just um, uh, adhere to the code. So um, I think at this point um, I should, you know, stop and uh, let uh, Mr. Wheeler, our Assistant Secretary of State, and, um, and we're very proud of him because he's also continuing to pursue his degree in African American Studies. And uh, I think he can take this over uh, from his perspective. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Melba Boyd, uh, shall I, uh, Peter, uh, I'm just going to go ahead. Is that okay? Uh, first of all, that was fascinating, Dr. Boyd. Uh, our lives have been parallel in so many ways, and it is fascinating to hear how things that happened very, very early in our lives have really shaped our consciousness and shaped our commitment. And, and, and this is not exactly where I was going to start. I've got a couple of notes sitting right next to me, but I have to tell you, when I was 12 or 13, stress, that same decoy, decoy rope police unit, they helped shape my life. They came into our neighborhood and they beat down one of my best friends. And his mother came out and said, uh, officer, officer, why are you beating my son like that? And the police turned around and knocked the crap out of her. And I made the decision at 12 or 13 that if I could ever fix that, if I could ever right that wrong, uh, that that would become some of my life work. Uh, and that's why I've never liked the police. I have friends and family members who are police, but I've always had attention. And so when they talk about these uh, uh, compromised immune systems and, and uh, comorbidities, if you're black in America, it's a good chance that you've got five or 10 points higher blood pressure than you would uh, otherwise, because you know that a chance encounter with a police officer can be a death sentence, mm -hmm. a chance encounter. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate your history, uh, Dr. Boyd, because you really highlighted it was, a, in fact, Boyd, uh, Bethune Boyd and Brown, those were some of our, our heroes as teenagers. And when the police came through our neighborhood, everybody in unison, we would say one, two, three, off the pigs. You remember those? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's how much we hated the police when we were kids. So you've, uh, you've really highlighted uh, uh, some things that are especially significant to what I wanted to talk about. Uh, so let me say, Peter Hammer, you are my man. I appreciate you moderating and facilitating and just being who you are. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this very, very important conversation. And Dr. J, uh, just the, the hardest working man in and academic show business. I, I appreciate you helping me all the time and, and thank you so very much. So I'm excited to be a part of this conversation and I entitled my uh, remarks, History, Hope and Kairos. Uh, History, Hope and Kairos because I wanted to add a little bit of historical perspective and I know how important it is for all of us uh, to keep hope alive uh, and Kairos is when, when the right issue and the right people and divine intervention all converge, uh, those are Kairos moments. And I think the murder, uh, the brutal murder of George Floyd has triggered a Kairos moment. And I know uh, a, a lot about each of you. We've all worked for these type, we've worked on these kinds of issues for most of our lives, but I'll bet you not one of us could have predicted the energy that's in the street around the world, not one of us could have predicted this. And so when I see black folk and white folk, young folk and old folk all in the street, hundreds of cities across this country, dozens of countries around the world, everybody understands anti-black racism. Everybody understands anti-black racism. And I am just delighted to see that uh, people are tired of it. So I think this is more than a moment. 
I think this has triggered a movement. And I think it is especially significant that, that we keep this in perspective and, and do more of what we do well. Uh, those of us who have been called to leadership moments, we've got to help shape the narrative. If you remember initially when uh, the protesters were taken to downtown, most of the media leaders wanted to talk about violence and provocateurs. Uh, but the, rea the reality, uh, we know how important it is to keep the main thing the main thing. And, and the main thing is rogue and rogue policing and racism uh, and, and, and the murder of, of black, innocent black men. Uh, so I think that's especially significant. But let's add some historical perspective. 1619 uh, through 1865, we know that was uh, slavery and it was brutality, abject brutality. I mean, people had their way with black lives. They had their way. They could do whatever. We were less than animals. Uh, so that set the stage for our experiences in uh, this uh, Amer this, same pla this place called America. But if you go deeper, and this is why I love African American studies, because there were always protests, there were always uprising. Uh, history does not celebrate the resilience uh, that Africans and African Americans had to live to even get through that. Uh, so people have always uh, been fighting for freedom, and we've always been fighting back and then uh, the next significant phase in history from 1865 through 1965, that was legalized segregation. Uh, but that, too, was wrought with brutality, uh, the KKK and lynchings. So if you say 1619 to 1865, slavery, 1865 to 1965, legalized segregation, put it in historical perspective uh, from 1965 through today, 2020, we've only had 55 years of something else. We've only had 55 years of something else, and that has been wrought with all kinds of brutality, all kinds of uh, endless challenges. So I appreciate, uh, Dr. Boyd, all of the things that you've highlighted. But let's put let's add another uh, bit of perspective. Uh, uh, and let me show you how divine intervention and the, this Kairos moment all sort of comes together. Do you know uh, the connection between Emmett Till uh, Martin Luther King and Barack Obama. And not to put you on the spot, but there is a concept called divine providence, but it was August 28 of 1955 when Emmett Till was killed. It was also August 28 of 1963 when Martin Luther King gave his famous rendition of I Have a Dream. But do you also know that it was August 28 again? of 2008 when a black man took to the podium at the Democratic National Convention to accept the nomination to become president of the United States. That's divine providence. That's bigger than all of us. So I am saying we are in a, a very, very divine moment. Uh, uh, and I expect good things to come out of this moment, which has uh, morphed into a movement. And if we just look at the, the last 30 years, for example, we've had George, Floyd, we've had the murder of George Floyd uh, all across this country, and it's a regular part of the anti-Black racism that we've had to deal with. But, and, and I'm particularly pleased, Dr. Boyd, you highlighted some of uh, my heroes. Uh, uh, when you talk about Ken Cockrell, when you talk about the work of, of, of Coleman Young, it made the difference. I actually left Wayne State University's campus in the late 70s because uh, Mayor Coleman Young dispatched a lot of his lieutenants and they were recruiting young African-Americans in particular, men and women, to consider joining the police department and the fire department. I actually left in the late 70s. I left campus, went to police recruitment, left campus, went to fire department, and I actually got hired as a firefighter. And I worked as a firefighter in the city of Detroit uh, for all of the 80s. So the fact that uh, uh, I'm good looking, that's just by birth. But the fact that you see all these muscles and all of this extra power, that's because I had that real physically demanding job as a firefighter. But think about it, 1991, Rodney King, 54 blows. And the police said, Rodney King controlled the action. You remember that? That too was a defining moment. 1992, Malice Green. Uh, another defining moment, and only because we had the strength of a black man and Mayor Coleman Young, he said very publicly, this was a murder. 
and the media went crazy. Mr. Mayor, you can't say that. You can't influence these outcomes. They've not even had a trial. But if you think of, if you put this in historical perspective again, Kim Worthy was an outstanding prosecutor. Uh, she had those long, pretty nails. She was dressed at nice. But more important than all of that, she was thoroughly prepared. She came to fight every day. And Kim Worthy was one of the first prosecutors in America to get a guilty sentence against police officers that were on duty. That changed the trajectory. That never happened across America. So Kim Worthy has earned a place in history. Then you've had back-to-back -back, Amadou Diallo, 22-year-old black man in New York, 41 shots, police shot 41 times. Trayvon Martin in 2012. It's a, I mean, there are dozens in between. But the reason I mentioned Trayvon in particular, because that's where we became familiar with this thing called stand your ground. Uh, white folk are always changing the rule to say that they have the right to do some foolishness. Uh, but 600 black people have been shot or killed since Trayvon Martin. That's what makes uh, Trayvon Martin a defining moment from Eric Garner choked to death selling cigarettes in 2004. Trayvon Martin in 2012, Eric Garner in 2014, Michael Brown in and Ferguson, Missouri, and you guys know uh, that Ferguson finally got their first African-American uh, mayor. And, and you said something else, Dr. Boyd, that is so true. Uh, sometimes the uh, same skin uh, can also mean no kin. The fact that we look alike don't mean we are, in fact, alike. Uh, and you saw that with Black. We fought back in 40 years or so ago for Black police officers, but it hasn't mattered at the level we thought it would because they, not only were they just Black, but they were also blue and they subscribe to that code of silence and so i've been speaking at rallies across this uh, region and across this community and i've been I, you know I, I respect what police have to do i do but you can't come into our community and say uh, uh if you see something say something when in fact as a police officer you see crap every day and you never say anything so you can't hold the community to a different standard than you live so I think that's especially significant. Philando Castile, two, uh, July of 2016. Uh, we saw it again on video. That's the game changer. Now all of this stuff has always happened. The difference is now it's on video. But guess who had uh, been uh, the longtime prosecutor right there in Minneapolis who uh, chose to run for president last uh, earlier this year? You, you guys know that history? And not to quiz you, but you know Amy Klobuchar comes out of that experience. Amy Klobuchar uh, uh, was prosecutor in uh, the county surrounding Minneapolis from 1999 to 2007. Uh, she never prosecuted a police officer. 122 charges of misconduct on her watch, and she never prosecuted a police officer. So it was just a matter of time before she would have to uh, uh, re uh, reveal who she really is. But they settled. Uh, police misconduct misconduct charges uh, to the tune of millions of dollars. So we've got a long history of anti-black racism. So don't get it twisted. I understand brown, uh, red and yellow, uh, black and white, but this is anti-black racism. And I, as a black man, uh, Dr. J, I think they're afraid of us. I'm not sure what the heck it is, but I, I, I think they're afraid of us. My dad uh, my, my dad, my, my father-in-law used to always say, uh, Hester, you know, getting older is not for chumps. Uh, but the fact is being black in America is not for chumps. I mean, this is work every day. Uh, you've got to do some things. So the criminalization system, uh, had, and I don't refer to it as a criminal justice system because it's, there is no justice in it for, for uh, the African-American experience. Uh, but uh, they never see the humanity in Black people, and that's the bottom line. Uh, Dr. Boyd, you referenced the Kerner Commission that said we're evolving into two societies, one Black, one white, one poor, one wealthy. We see that happening. Look at uh, Amy Cooper, for example. I think that, that's a very important example of, of this standard. Uh, Amy Cooper, white woman in New York in a park, she chose to call the police and say, hey, there's a black man threatening me. She knew her privilege. And she knew that if she declared a black man was harassing her, she knew what that meant. How did uh, how did a white racist rogue police officer dare keep his knee in the neck of a black man for eight minutes and 46 seconds with all these video cameras? Because he understood his prim privilege and he knew that he uh, would be exonerated because that is the trend. So uh, both
Amy and, and, and rogue police officers, they know that blacks are expendable. They know that the government would protect white privilege. Ahmaud Arbery was jogging and brutally murdered in Georgia. Uh, and, the re and the unfortunate reality, it was two months later before anybody was charged. And that was only after video uh, was revealed. Breonna Taylor shot eight times. Police fired over 20 shots into her uh, uh, apartment. And guess who's been charged so far? Her boyfriend, who was defending his, his home. So we've got so much work to do. Anti-Black racism is the challenge. Racist rogue police officer uh, are, 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 the, are the challenge. How do we arrive at a COVID-19 moment and we recognize that it is uh, such a pandemic that we declare a state of emergency, but we, 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 we agree that rogue policing is pandemic. We agree that racism is pandemic but we've yet to declare a state of emergency. So that's the work we have to do going forward. I am so excited to see all these people in the street. I, I didn't know it would continue on like this, uh, but I do know the greatness of America is reflected in our right to protest for rights. And I think you have to keep fighting, stay in this particular fight. Think about it, Greensboro, I mean, uh, 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 Birmingham lasted 37 days. We changed America. Uh, Greensboro, the sit-ins lasted six months. We changed America. Freedom rides lasted seven months. We changed America. Montgomery bus boycott lasted 382 days. We changed America. We got the Civil Rights Act. We got the Voting Rights Act. We got the Fair Housing Act. We got the Community Reinvestment Act and a whole bunch of other things, equal opportunity programs, affirmative action, but it took taking to the streets. So I'm saying it's time for us to dress Rogue police officers is time for us to address racism. I think we got to normalize the conversation about race. All of my white friends, man, I've been within 48 hours after George Floyd, I bet you 20 of my white friends, they call me privately and they say, Hester, Hester, how are you, Hester? How you doing? How you, how you doing, buddy, friend? You, uh, uh, how, how are you feeling? I'm saying this is where I need you uh, to do your best work. You don't need to. Just talk to me. I live this racism all the time. I need for white people to talk to white people. I need for you to uh, 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 express your uh, feelings through an op-ed. Uh, go very, very public with your commitment. Uh, but let's, I, 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 this conversation about defunding the police, I love the conversation. I think we should use words like reimagining or re-engineering uh, because I think that is a, this is a critical moment. But police, Reimagining and re-engineering policing is just one component. We got to fight. We got to keep fighting for housing and home ownership opportunities. We got to keep fighting to fix education and fight for economic empowerment and various other opportunities. Uh, but look at all the things that have happened since the murder of George Floyd. I mean, in just the first 10 days, and uh, Dr. J, I sent you a nice list of some of those things, but in the first 10 days, police departments, hundreds of police departments announced various reforms. No more chokeholds. We're not gonna kill the Negroes the same way we used to kill them. Uh, uh, and then uh, racist symbols are coming down. Even in downtown Detroit, uh, the statue of Christopher Columbus has been taken down all across the country, hundreds of millions of dollars. We had corporate leaders right here in Detroit. All of a sudden they found hundreds of millions of dollars. Are you, t Dr. Boyd, Peter, Dr. J, you, you're telling me they had that money all the time? It was just sitting there? Uh, that is fascinating to me. And the last thing I'll say is uh, even poor Uncle Ben is coming off the rice boxes and, and poor Aunt Jemima. We had this argument 40 years ago and Aunt Jemima is finally coming off the pancake box. So this is about history. This is about hope. And this is about Kairos. Uh, it's, a, it's a magic moment where the right people, the right issues, and divine intervention all converge. And when people ask us, how long do we fight? There's only one answer. We fight until we win. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Hester. Thank you so much, Melba. Very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. We have questions. I just want to say that Black Lives Matter, that's what I took from your talks. I also uh, feel that we need a revolution. We need a revolution in values. We need a revolution in thinking. We need a revolution in behavior. We need a revolution in 
our institutions and the structures of society. You're right, Hester, it goes beyond policing. We really need to get busy fighting for freedom, justice, and equality for black people and all people. We can do it. And so all praise to the protesters who are not letting up, who are reminding the world that we have work to do. We have work to do. We have 200 uh, viewers. Thank you for your patience. We only have about 12, 13 minutes left, so I'm gonna to get to your questions. Uh, one of the important questions is, what can I do personally to eradicate systemic racism? Hester or Melba? Melba, you wanna go first? I'm mute. I'm mute. I think she's asking you to uh, respond. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think there are a series of things. Uh, the, the one unfortunate reality uh, is that you cannot legislate attitudes, uh, but I do know the power of legislation. We've got to change some laws. Uh, since serving as Assistant Secretary of State, I've uh, gotten closer to some real issues. Uh, mm -hmm. Driver responsibility fees, for example, was uh, poor people penalty for not being able to afford auto insurance. We got to change that kind of foolishness. 311,000 people lost their driver's license. We still have uh, and 79,000 were right here in the city of Detroit. You got to fight. You got to get involved with some initiative that uh, that uh, embraces a commitment to anti-racism. You got to show up. You got to go to meetings. You got to be a part of some solutions. You got to go to Lansing. And you got to champion uh, the normalization of conversations about race. We got to normalize. I hate when white people say, I don't know how to talk about race. Well, you talk about everything else. So, uh, and, and I think brilliance is transferable. You got to normalize this conversation about race and anti-racism. Mm -hmm. Another question. What can I do to help support this movement? Um, I think to some extent, um, Hester has pretty much answered that, you know, get involved. Get involved. Uh, get involved. And, but there was, uh, you know, there are questions about on a personal level, you know, uh, what can I do? Um, one of the things that I, I always tell my students at the end of the semester is that your most important challenge is going to uh, protect your integrity by saying and standing for the right thing when you're out there in the world. Mm -hmm. Systemic racism persists because so many people just plug into the matrix and just go along with the flow. And they're afraid to stand up. And they're afraid to stand up because uh, they're afraid they may lose their job. They're afraid to counter, for example, a racist statement um, in any situation, uh, but especially in, in one's work environment or in one's church or whatever institution you already belong to, to speak to um, racist actions and behavior whenever it's, it's in front of you. And uh, it's difficult, uh, but I think that if more people would stand up and, and identify and speak to things that you know in your heart, you know in your gut when someone's not being treated fairly. I don't care what anybody says. I think they, you know when something wrong is being said or something wrong is being done. You know, it's important to, you know, recognize it um, and contradict it when it's happening. And, and that's something that, you know, you can do on a, on, a, on a small level, but you'd be surprised. I remember when I was going through university, especially when I was in graduate school and you'd encounter, I'd encounter these racist sort of attitudes and values of professors who didn't feel that I was supposed to be there. Yes. And it was the other professors. I mean, they they were all white men, you know, <laughs> but there were um, other professors who said, "No, this is wrong," and they supported me. And if they had not done that, um, you know, I would have never made it through graduate school. So, just on a basic personal level, when something wrong is happening. You need to, you know, you need to speak to that, and it would just make life, um, the quality of life, for someone else to to do something for someone else or to to ad identify uh, uh, racism when it's operating within your 
within your purview, within your space, and 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 dealing with it on the spot. Uh, but also on a personal level, you can educate yourself. Um, you know, there, you know, we this this movement that we're talking about now, all these things have been documented and um, and written about, and you know, you can you can educate yourself on the struggle of black people in this country. And it's really interesting. I just want to say that it always blows my mind that the line is when usually the cop does shoot somebody, they'll say, well, I fear for my life. Even if the guy's running away, <laughs> uh, I'm afraid of him because he's running away. I, I, but the point is, is that the real deal is we fear the police. Yes. We fear the police. And, you know, and, and so their fear is really not supposed to be a part of their uh, professionalism. If you're afraid of black people, then you should not be a police That's officer. Right. That's exactly right. That's just it. It's just it. You know, don't do the job. If you're scared, then you shouldn't be there. Because when when you're scared, you're going to make irrational decisions. You know, if you don't have the courage and and also then therefore the training, uh, these officers need to be trained. They need to be educated. Um, I gave this talk not too long ago to the Academy of Scholars and. And I said, you know, as a professor, I had to have three degrees and publish all these books, these articles to be who I am and where I am in this job. And if I do something wrong, the worst thing that's going to happen is I may confuse somebody. Mm. But it doesn't end in death. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's the thing. You, these people have power over life and death, and there's not enough training. Also, I really appreciated what Hester said about... Um, in uh, reimagining, re-engineering police. Uh, and I think that's a part of it. It's, it's also part of understanding that police shouldn't be in a lot of situations without yeah. certain kinds of professional support. There's a need for social workers, for psychologists. These people need to be working with the police. They should be people who can be uh, you know, on the ground when there is, in particular, a domestic dispute. They don't have the, the the ability to 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 moderate that situation, you know. There are a lot of things that should happen in terms of the way that people should be policed, in the same in the spirit of they're there to help you, not to hurt you. Even if you are a criminal and you've committed a crime, we do not have capital punishment in the state of Michigan. We don't have it. And if and if a policeman shoots someone who they think is a thief, someone who even has even killed someone, you still don't have capital punishment in the state of Michigan. And that's what it ends up being. Capital that's punishment. exactly Good We point. have uh, time for one more question. I want to remind the audience that we will meet a week from now, same time, uh, 12 noon, for a uh, community talk back because we haven't had enough time. I've got a list of questions from you. We don't have enough time, but the audience asked to hear from Peter Hammer. And so this, this may be our last question. Uh, Peter, how can we ask the community to vote and put um, elected officials into office when uh, various forces, including some officials, are trying to disenfranchise the community, trying to make it more difficult to vote legally and illegally? Yeah. No. Um if you asked to what uh, got Judge Damon J. Keith most exercised, it was voting rights. Uh, you talk about suppression of voting rights, and, right. and and his blood pressure would get up, and he'd get animated because his generation they lived and died uh, to get the right to vote. Uh, and the right to vote is important, but I also think it's important to realize uh, that younger folks today don't see the value of the vote because voting has never done anything for them. And we have to also honor and address the estrangement within African American communities. Uh, other disenfranchised communities, uh, and we're fight for our lives because people are trying to take the vote away, uh, which is why I'm so excited to have Hester Wheeler uh, as Assistant Secretary of State. And if people don't understand the role of the Secretary of the State, they're there to protect our right to vote. Uh, and so we've got uh, amazing leadership in that position, uh, and that excites me. Um, but I just sort of I'll take a, a moment to say uh, that it's great that white people are concerned about anti-Black racist now. And it's great they want to see how they can help Detroit. But I just want to make sure we do root cause analysis, uh, that racism is created by white people and white communities yes. for white people. 
Uh, and if white people really want to address racism, uh, yes. they're going to have to take it to their families. They're going to have to take it to their communities. Uh, and they should be saying, what can I do in Birmingham? Uh, to address racism? What can I do in Ann Arbor to address racism? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we've seen the power of the leadership of, of black voices in black Detroit, which has been the focus. Uh, we also have to remember that it's gonna be uh, white people fighting for liberation of themselves at the end of the day, uh, in hand in hand with other people uh, and black Americans that are gonna be critical. Um, but you also see the power of taking leadership uh, from people like Melba uh, and, and people like Hester. So just wonderful gratitude for you both uh, and great appreciation, not just what you did today, but what you've done uh, your whole lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Melba. Thank you so much, Hester. Uh, I believe in revolution. I think that's what we need. I think we can all be free. I think uh, we need reparations. Hester, you talked about millions. I think we need to talk about billions and trillions. That's right. Uh, transfer to education, health, mm -hmm. welfare, uh, creating a more egalitarian society. We can do it. I want to, um, again, encourage everybody to meet up a week from today, 12 noon, and you can uh, get the info at go.wayne.edu backslash talk back. Um, we have a minute left. Uh, Hester, Melba, any 30-second um, closing comments? I'll just say very quickly, I believe the very best way to predict the future is to create it. You've got to work with young people. You've got to make the difference. Uh, you've got to keep creating pathways out of poverty. And always remember that, like you said, Dr. J, money changes everything. Mm -hmm. Um, am I on? I, okay. Um, I think, obviously, as, as, an, as a scholar of African American studies, um, that it is important for Americans to know everybody's history and circumstances in this country. I think it is very important that our educational institutions support um, programs like um, African American studies, uh, Latino studies. Um, the Center for Civil Rights, um, named after our uh, wonderful judge, um, Damon J. Keith. I think it needs to be a priority, not something that's extra. Uh, it needs to be essential. There needs to be more presence of Black people throughout the university, especially in the faculty. Um, there's a, a, a dearth of Black faculty at even Wayne State University, and it, it doesn't makes sense because we have PhDs who can be in these departments, who could be teaching and expanding uh, the perception of the way that people think about uh, what it is to be knowledgeable um, and, and to address the need for the humanities, to embrace the humanities. We got this unfortunate shift um, focusing on math and science and I'm all for that. You know, I had two fathers who are engineers. I have a son who's an engineer. But my son also took African American studies courses at the University of Michigan, his whole you know, uh, academic career. Because you need to be, you need to know your history and other people need to know our history. And I wanna just say one thing that when I travel and this, the protests that are going on in Paris and so forth, um, they teach African American studies in all the major universities you know, in, in Europe. And I've spoken at a number of them and their perception of African-Americans is that we are in the vanguard of the struggle for this to become a true democracy. And they appreciate that, that, that struggle. And they identify with how important that struggle is, you know, for the future of the United States and, and very specifically for this idea and this ideal of democracy and equity. Thank you so much, Melba. Thank you so much, Hester. Thank you so much, Peter. I would also like to thank uh, the folks behind the scenes, off screen, Jessica, yeah. Mel, Kaylee. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, and we look forward to doing it again next week. Thank you so much. Peace and blessings. Wayne State University has always been a leader. Detroit has always been a leader, and we got to lead now. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you so much. Keep hope alive.